Yeah, right. And the queen is here. Good to see you guys. I think there was a bad analogy, actually. It is the queen. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Dave Schmidt is the Kaiser of this class. Um, okay. Welcome, everyone. There, there's 6,321 people on Zoom right now. It's good. <laughs> Keep those numbers up. If you know people else, that's we want about 7,000 is normal for us. We're good. Welcome to the first class of America. This guy's laughing at me being sarcastic. There's 6,321 people, I promise. 20 now, one person left. That's You're right. Really one person left. That's still over 6,000. I am so honored, blessed, happy to have all of you here. I hope all of you, how many people are here for real? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, thirteen. 10, 11, 13. This is good. It's fantastic. Um, I hope we violate, like, go, we do like social sardini, the opposite of distance mm -hmm. in this room. We'll pack it in as close as we can. 30, 40 people. For health officials listening on the Zoom, by that I mean we're following all CDC guidelines. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever wants to join, like I said earlier, if you can't make it in person, it's going to be Monday and Wednesday the whole semester with the exception of, um, I think, spring break. Uh, I, I cleave to U of I schedule for that. A lot of you are U of I students, U of I community, whatever. We'll be off then. That's actually the first item of business we're going to discuss today is the syllabus, all right? So if you see on the board, which Trish Schmidt was, was rightfully complaining about, she's right, she's not wrong, this disgusting glare, and then this, this kind of penmanship that blends into it, the it just fits me out, she's right. It's hard to see, I'll walk you through it. The first thing we're gonna do is introductions, form, and syllabus. By form, I mean, what is the class gonna look like? What can you expect? Because I hope that you will be all with me throughout the duration until, uh, until May. My guarantee to you, my infomercial guarantee is, uh, however well you think you know the Civil War at this point, I'm sure a lot of you actually know it fairly well. It's a very, very important, monumentous um, event in American history. Um, you'll know it better. You'll know it more completely. And kind of the pitch I gave yesterday in mass for anyone who's at 1030, I said, we have this, this problem in society now, right? It's almost, you know, it's, it's hard to define. It, you talk to a liberal, you talk to a conservative, they'll talk about it in different ways, right? Fracturing, polarization society. I kind of want to investigate and play around with, okay, what were some things that were going on then? How did society get to a point where people actually took up arms and fought a civil war? This name is brother versus brother conflict, and how can we um, avoid that? Can I Anna, yes. <laughs> There's somebody who needs a password to get to use Oh, tell them I have no clue what it is. I, tell, them, tell them what I did. Was. <laughs> See, well, the 6,000 people were able to get on Zoom after passcode. Okay, tell them, tell them seriously, like, okay, verbatim, ready? Like, copy what I'm going to say, word for word. Okay. Be like, I'm first, first of all, happy new year. He said, first of all, happy new year. Okay. And second, be like, the way I got on was I had actually logged into Vandal Catholic because it was when I, when I got, went on the website, it said enter passcode and I couldn't do anything. Huh. It just pops up. Dave Schmidt has had this problem too. Yeah. I had to log on to Vandal Catholic and then access it through there. If you want to give them the password of the Vandal Catholic, just to get on. Yeah, to tell them to log into the Vandal Catholic Zoom and then click the link. That's how it worked for me. Hmm. Maybe what I'll do from now on is make um, individual links that I'll email to all of you. In fact, actually, all of you could do me a huge favor. My, my email is intellect at vandalcatholic.com. Send me an email. Tell this person too, to send me an email. I want to be on the class list. Prior to every class, I'll send an actual Zoom link with a passcode. Okay. Quite important. Maybe today just give them the info to log in and have hmm. that. Yeah. Like when I logged into our Vandal Catholic site or the, the Vandal Catholic Zoom, then I just went to the website, unrelated, and was able to click it and it popped up. But I couldn't access the passcode. I don't know why it's requiring this. Okay, I'll get your email and I'll over that. Okay. Hey, thanks. Anna Crescens came to class too. That's always positive. Thank you for thank you for appearing class. Thank Can you give a round of applause, please? Oh, That's true. All right. So we're gonna cover, we're gonna go over the syllabus and talk about kind of what to expect. And then I am going to cover for you B and C. B is a four-point thematic mix. What are some themes in American history that lead up to the war? And then some key chronological events between 1776 to 1830. Uh, because if you see the long drawn arrow, 1861 to 65 is the American Civil War. Consider that, I think often in a class, oh, if I'm a student, if I can leave with like one piece of information, it's positive. You know, if I remember one thing, but I'm, I'm a total moron, but if I come to class and I remember one thing a class, like 40 classes, 40 things, that's good, right? This is the first thing all of you definitely can leave this class with feeling like really positive and good about yourselves. And all of you are super, super smart people. You're not like me. So you're going to learn a bunch of stuff beyond just the one. 
But that's one thing for sure. Know that at least. All right. People get historians a hard time, and, and they're right. Historians are often very, very boring. Um, I'm an exception to the rule, but most people, historians are horrifyingly boring. And dates are very, very boring, memorizing stuff, but you do need to know where one thing comes after the other, right? If I ask you, like, well, you know, what's really important about World War II? And you're like, did that happen in 1780 or 1975? Like, right, right? It's a problem. You have to know, right? To know 1939, 1945. First thing in this class, please know when the American Civil War takes place so that as we go through the class, through the antebellum pre-war period today and in the next couple of weeks, to the actual war years and into Reconstruction, roughly from 1865 to 77, you have a good grasp of what we're talking about, right? A lot of people that were on the Zoom or last year with me when we covered the Great War, the World War I, automatically you have this nice chronological understanding. So if you have, for instance, well, oh, World War I starts in 1914, Right, that's what 35 plus 49 years, half a century before the First World War. You get this good understanding of kind of where we are in the larger flow. All right. So, point A was everyone able to access the syllabus on VandalCatholic.com? Yeah, people were. Sure, Does anyone not know what internet is? <laughs> I wish I did. <laughs> yeah, okay. I just found out about the class. You found out about the class 15 minutes ago. That's good. No, that's that's fair enough. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, yeah, it's not a graded class. No. I'll bring I'll bring hard copies. I can bring hard copies. Thanks. Hunter's right. No, it, that, that's by the way, this class. It's graded, but how can it follow? It's true. But this is this is the awesome like we can do cognitive dissonance and right. Like this is relative isn't done correct. You're both right at the same time. <laughs> this is awesome. a rare this is a rare moment. <laughs> but like he's right. Nothing, and I have him here very, in a very misleading, dishonest, and, and you know, to be quite frank, very disrespectful way by me to list grading percentages. The class isn't graded. Why would I put that on there? Um, <laughs> there are no grades in this class. It's not for credit. It's for Thomas Jefferson style love of wisdom, okay? Like literally philosophy, okay? However, I, I will happily bring a hard copy for you, especially because Anna was kind enough to print them double sided. It's just one sheet of paper. It's very, very convenient to hold around. Thank you. you know the people that are like really, really patriot, patriot patriotic, and they walk around with a copy of the pop Constitution. Uh -huh. Like you could carry my thing in your glass. In your body. <laughs> <laughs> you could always be like, "Oh, contraire! <laughs> social unrest in New York City was at the same time as the Great Riots in the South. How dare you?" <laughs> and then you have to prove it's on the syllabus, right? <laughs> right. So office hours, TDA. I don't, I don't know what that acronym means. I'm sorry. Um, six to eight hours weekly at St. Augustine, Augustine's Catholic Center. My office is right behind this door, but I'm usually in here or there. Uh, the classroom time, as you saw, is Monday and Wednesday from 1 to 2.30. Uh, that's great music. Thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> course description. Never, never apologize. Please play it louder next time, please. <laughs> I'm dead, I'm dead serious. Dave, you can I was it. sending you the email you asked for. Dave, I, I swear to you, you know, you can do no wrong with my eyes. Like, if you punch me, I'd be like, thanks. Um, course, <laughs> course description and approach. I, I'm not going to like patronize you guys read the syllabus word for it. Just basically, right? A brief in, in, investigation of the antebellum period to cover the warriors. We spent a month on the chronology, okay? The last sentence the goal is for students to acquire a deep and comprehensive knowledge in Civil War reconstruction by looking at the era through different and diverse lenses, blah, blah, blah. Uh, to get the most complete picture. Right, this class is simply, how deep can we go on 1861 and 65, both me giving you the chronology, the books we're gonna read, we have seven required books. Again, scare quoted required, uh, don't buy them at all if you don't want. There's no, we're not gonna get punished, how? But if you want the most full, complete experience from these, these different historians, from myself, how can we give you the most complete picture and then apply those lessons hopefully to your life now, right? I, I say this a million times, I couldn't care less whether you're liberal, conservative, even whether you're Catholic or not, right? I'm not here to, uh, you know, form your opinion in that way. I simply want to present the most complete picture possible and you apply it to your life however you want. We're going to skip over grading scale percentages because I just talked about that. Um, required books, seven listed right here. Uh, the author and then the titles I italicized, in case anyone's confused, all right? The, the book is not titled Ganath by Abraham Lincoln Civil War America. That'd be a long, bumbling name. That's the name of the, of the book. I guess anyone's, what you, you know what I'm saying? Like, where do I type an author name, title? I think it's self explanatory What's most important is the class by class lectures, honestly. I aim to follow this very, very faith, faithfully throughout the semester. So you can see, right, from January 10th, which is today until May 4th, everything we're doing. 
And the reason I say that especially, imagine even if this was a class at U of I proper on campus and it was for credit, I would still say like, of course, you can miss two or three classes or whatever, people have lives. Even if it was strictly for grade, you may decide to strategically miss a certain class. You might say, for instance, like, okay, the uh, discussion on March 7th on nationalism, we're reading from Gnapp's book and Emory Thomas's book. You know, we're gonna be discussing 60 pages of material in that class. I think the previous discussion that I had Will be sufficient. I'll have read those books. I want to miss that class. And especially because the next class is an in-class competition, whatever that is. I don't, I don't like, I'm scared of competition. Maybe that's you. So I want to miss that as well. And then have spring break. And then you strategically plan it that way. Or maybe you have a friend who's like, I don't know when I can make the class. I have maybe well, heavy lab stuff in the, in the front of the semester, but I really want to get to the books. I'm not so interested in the chronology, which is January through February. I want to really discuss the kind of historical books. I'll come then. Please know that I sincerely hope that all of you um, come every class. Um, if you don't come, you may expect me to say, like, I, I won't care or be offended. I will I'll be very offended and hurt if you choose not to come. So I hope you do come. And I'll, I'll have a personal vendetta against you. I, I swear. <laughs> if you didn't want that to be on the table, you shouldn't come in the first place. Now that I know you come and you don't come, yeah. So I hope you do come. I have a question. Which is yes. the first book that we should read? Excellent. I'm a reader. So. Excellent question. Really, yeah. brilliant question. Thank you. So on all, if you go to the, and I'll try to bring in hard copies as well for everyone. If you go on the website, you get the syllabus. On the class by class lectures, I'll always specify what we're reading. The actual first book we read is already a week from today. Edward Ayers, um, <clears throat> What Caused the Civil War? Reflection of the South and Southern History. So whenever, this is a brilliant question again. Thank you. Because the assigned reading is not to be done after the class. You should have it done for that class. So for instance, March 17th, when we from today, we talk about 1848 to 1860, John Brown, really to the doorstep of the war. And then ideally in that class, we'll discuss those 37 to 63, those pages of Edward Perry's book, okay? <clears throat> Textbook to the class, you can say if there is one, is James McPherson's um, Battle Cry of Freedom, I think it's called. Battle Cry of Freedom, the Civil War Era. Um, and we read that throughout the class, right? So already Aaron, we're talking about McPherson 6 through 46, uh, 40 pages there on the 19th. And you see it goes all the way through the, through the whole semester, right? The other books really are heavily thematically based. For instance, the Gnapp and the Emory Thomas, like I mentioned earlier, is not until March. Uh, George Raybould, who wrote a very good book on American religious, on religious history in the Civil War, that's not until the end of March. Same thing with Drew Gilpin Faust and Suffering. So you can read it strategically based on the class-by-class -class lectures. I do think not being sarcastic for a moment, that I've planned this well and that it tells you when we're going to be doing stuff. So you avoid the trap of like, oh, I'll read Eric Foner on Reconstruction now, which I don't have to talk about for three months, but I won't read the books up front. I will say we're almost never going to be discussing McPherson. So for instance, on March, on Monday, February 7th, those 30 pages of McPherson, we're going to be talking about First Manassas, McClellan, the Peninsula Campaign, chronology. McPherson is in support of what you're doing. Basically, for lack of a better word, there's six books in this class that we're going to discuss. What's the historiographical import, what the authors say? The McPherson book is just for you, almost like a, Wiki a Wikipedia article throughout, just giving you basic facts. Um, Do you have a suggestion as to where these are available, or you're on your own? Good luck. Yeah, or definitely that. Good luck. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. But no, really. Um, if you don't want to give money to, to, to Rocket Man Bezos, um, <laughs> you can go to abebooks.com. Abebooks.com. This is not a Civil War joke. Like, are you kidding me, dude? Abebooks, like Lincoln, are you freaking kidding me? No, really, abebooks.com. And the problem is, like, they should list there. They'll talk about, you know, book condition, right? Like, mint, really good, used. They should have, like, grimy, like, pulled out of a sewer. Because some of these books you buy, <laughs> some of these books you buy are, like, marked up, pages falling out, they're horrible. The, the, the sewer version is like 17 cents. So some of these like these used books you can get for a really good deal. I don't, I think you seem like a very wise person. You don't care, right? I'll, I want the 17 cent deal. I'll go through the coffee stains and uh, who cares if half the book is missing? That's fine. So uh, yeah, Dave, <laughs> of course I'm- I'm kind of sorry I asked the question now. <laughs> I'm sorry I put you on this rabbit. Amazon, of course, just Google the titles, but aid books has always been a good kind of used book source. Barnes and Noble Heritage? Yeah, probably. I'd assume so. Yeah, by the way, I'm, I'm a big fan of like off the grid books, like, you know, unknown authors. 
these books are very, very like standard. McPherson is arguably the most famous American historian. Henry Thomas, the book on the on the Southern Nation of the Confederates, he's the most famous <clears throat> Confederate historian. These are very standard books. You, you probably actually can find them probably hard copy in Barnes and Noble, just walking in here, right? That's actually that'd be amazing. You know, report back if you do that. If you go to Barnes and Noble, it's very possible you could find all these books just in the history section. They're so common. They're not like hard. If you actually find the brick and mortar Barnes and Noble, you can in Spokane. Spokane now. Yeah. You just announced you're not from Spokane. <laughs> I learned something uh, in, in a sideways <laughs> way. Like, are, are you from Spokane? So I thought, because you would know from Oregon. He's from Oregon. He's not a pump gas. Yeah. That is legit. I know, dude. <laughs> <laughs> no, because it happens for one second. I was the Oregon coast, and this lovely guy comes out and pumps my gas for me. I was like, what a nice guy. I thought he was just being nice. I'm like, oh, he's the gas attendant. I thought he was supposed to be a nice guy. <laughs> How do you feel about this? Should people pump their own gas? Or Oregonians lazy? Like, why do they do that? What's the there's the actually a yeah. state yeah. law mm -hmm. that requires that in counties above 40,000, which is almost all of them, right? Uh, that gas must be pumped by the intended because apparently that creates jobs somehow. It's so not it's 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 jobs. Uh, I'm all for that. Yeah, it great. also yeah. creates economically when you had gas attendants, people bought yeah. windshield wipers <laughs> more frequently because. I'm not kidding. I yes, you. Wait, I'm wipers. laughing. That's true, but also and check your windshield wipers. Right. Hmm. So all those sales went up. Plus, I don't know about you people, but I do know people who have driven off <clears> with <throat> the <throat> gas thing in their car, <laughs> causing a dangerous situation. We want trained people pumping our gas because well, I, for one, don't like the smell of it on my hands. That's true. That's a good, that's a good well, point. So well, people <laughs> sue if you have a law like that. <laughs> Spoken like a true lawyer. Ah, <laughs> Spoken like a lawyer. If you, if you pull the pump out, if you pull the actual pumping thing out, they will come out and ask you to sign a waiver. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I have a question. I have a question. Do you guys ever do you think like, imagine if we had no like violence in the world, there was no prejudice in the world, right? Imagine a world like that. Like imagine a world with no lawyers. Like, wouldn't that be impossible? With no lawyers? Yeah. Like, it sounds a little boring. Like, that sounds too boring. All, all Farabi agrees with you, but it sounds a little boring. I don't agree. I'm a big we fan protect of you. I'm glad there's lawyers in the class. We protect you. I'm good. I'm glad. I'm good. There's, there's lawyers <laughs> all around me. Without lawyers, there would be dangerous products all around. <laughs> there would be dangerous or fun? Fun. I've been, fun. I've been fun. I've been I've been reduced fun. to silence as if in any like deposition. I have no response. You're right. It, I agree. It, I agree. Do, we, do we assume that conflict is a bad thing? That was actually like gonna be my, my main point. question when I heard about uh your class and you said how can we prevent like yeah. another civil war? Do we want to prevent? I don't know. Right. That's we up to you, that's up to you to say. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Your hand is raised. Assume you have a freaking question. <laughs> I was just gonna comment. No, I don't have a question, but I was gonna comment. I did think I read books and for the for the good of the group. I, I happened to search on First Republic of Suffering, the Republic of Suffering, and uh, three bucks hardcover. It's amazing. Yeah. So yeah, I got that book for like twenty six bucks. Hmm. Yeah, three dollars. So you can buy. I give you three home. bucks for your copy if you are done with it. No. <laughs> <laughs> Let me think. Wait. No. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but anyway, it looks like now, it's is, is a that promising. Eight or eight? Yes, yes. A A B E books.com. A books.com. Yes. Thank you. Of course. Yes. Totally yes. yes. Great question because exactly I just said them right with the search engine. What is A books? Yeah, yeah. A A B E his nickname. Exactly. Thank you. Happy hunting to all of you finding um these books. Okay, Sophia. I seriously like <laughs> Sophia. I begged her many, many times to like consider running for governor of Idaho in the future. Mm -hmm. Sophia is very good in this class of all her comments. So I don't mean to put her on the spot and possibly this true, but she's giving me this look like I remember from last week. She's like, when the F are we gonna get to the material and stop this nonsense? And so it's like, you're right, Sophia, I promise. Now we're starting now. So B, B, four point thematic mix. All right, I gave you one piece of information that was important, right, my friends? One piece, I said the Civil War is 1861 to 65. He doesn't seem too impressed. I agree, I'm not, you're right. Let me try to impress you now. Let me really try to impress all of you right now with some really good information. Or four things in this class religion, commerce, Greco Roman philosophy, enlightened liberal republicanism. I'm going to argue for enough of like a two inch snowfall, right? Just the first snowfall of the winter. We'll get into a lot of stuff later on, but just enough for today. Four background themes that can help you as we get into the revolutionary period, into the antebellum era, leading up to the Civil War, 
that can kind of help you as guiding themes to what really leads to this eventual fracture in the civil war. Who is the civil war between? Some of you might be too embarrassed to ask. Uh, the Union and the Confederacy, okay? The civil war is between the United States of America and other states in the South that form the Confederate States of America, the USA versus the CSA. Uh, and depending upon your point of view at that time and later on, these are either treasonous rebels who should have all been executed after the war or the successors to the revolutionary founding fathers who were rebelling against their version of King George III as Washington had rebelled against it, in the person of Abraham Lincoln as, as the founding fathers were rebelling against King George III. I swear to you in this class, I promise, I come on bending knee. I got my PhD in the South, in Mississippi. I'm obsessed with the South. I'm also a disgusting Yankee from Pennsylvania. So I'm both a Northerner and a Southerner. I'm the worst. I taught at the University of Illinois from the freaking land of Lincoln and from Mississippi, which is like an embarrassment even to Southerners, right? Like, well, this is the South. Well, uh, Mississippi's too far. Mississippi's a bridge too far. Yeah. So I have like, I have foot in the feet. Yeah, exactly. That's well, it's, 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 it's honestly true. Place. I have a former coworker from Texas and he's like, yeah, pretty much if anything's just wacky, we just blame Mississippi. He's right. Yeah. Is he, but is he wrong? But, no. is he wrong? <laughs> <laughs> but he's former coworker too. Yeah. So I wonder what the backstory is there. <laughs> His boss is Mississippi. He, he heard one too many Mississippians. Says. That's why he's former coworker. <laughs> um, you're right though, no, okay, so I'm just here, I'm, I'm not here to convince you some, really, there's one thing I hate in modern academia, it's kind of like dumb brainwashing, like, you have to think this way, don't you ever say anything bad about Abraham Lincoln ever, <laughs> what kind of crap like that, if you think Lincoln's the greatest American of all time, cool, if you think he's a tyrant and horrible, I'm going to present all the information I want you to judge, I don't want to judge, all right, my job is to present the information, I guess I skipped over, I even have here, right here, Be begin class with a general introduction of myself, super brief, I, it's because I'm, well, it's because you guys know me, I'm super famous. I mean, this is like, I'm sure like Leonardo DiCaprio doesn't do introductions. That's the level I'm on. You can already know me. But for those of you that don't, my ultimate credential to teach this class, why am I teaching class on the American Civil War? Why? This is the sixth class I've taught here. We've done architecture, we've done Catholicism in film, we've done um, the Great War last semester, right? This is actually my ultimate specialty, I'm happy to say. This is closest to my heart. My dissertation is on the Civil War. I'm, I'm technically a Civil War historian, the way a guy who's a doctor does like foot and ankle and say, I'm going to teach you how to do surgery with foot and ankle, like that kind of thing. So, so it's fun. And I in no, mean, no way do I imply that, oh, so I know this stuff like perfectly. I got invited when I was in Illinois to give a talk at the Champaign County Civil War Roundtable. And it was a bunch of older folk, people that were like, for lack of a better word, Civil War buffs. They definitely knew the Civil War better than I did, 100%. That's so gross, like, ooh, but I have a PhD. <laughs> I had a PhD. This guy like dropped out of like elementary school and he knew more about like facts of civil wars. So it's awesome. So, so hmm. that's the only kind of thing I want to say in this class. No prejudices in this class. My opinion does, isn't worth more than yours. And I'm not gonna try to brainwash you certain things. I want you to do stuff. I want you to read this stuff, then you come up with stuff. And we're gonna hear some crazy stuff probably. We, have, we already talked about people pumping their own gas in Oregon. What is the world coming to? I mean, this class is starting off on a good foot. So <laughs> Explain, you see, here's my problem with that. My, I agree, by the way, it's good. I'm from Pennsylvania. We're, oh no, I hate Oregon's gas pumping laws. You do. See, I, I love this it. is honestly yeah, the debate. That's my backup plan if I don't get into a PhD. So. <laughs> <laughs> is, it a bad, is it a bad life? To put yeah, that that is that, that's a life. <laughs> That's what that, that, yeah, yeah, I was going to say. Come out. This is what the point I was going to make is I'm from Pennsylvania and I border like the most embarrassing state in the history of the world, New Jersey. And they make you pump your own gas. They do. No, they, no, they do it for you. Yeah, they do it for you. In so it's like I have a prejudice because of New Jersey. Like anything associated with New Jersey is automatically negative in my mind. I think there's so, three states where you can't pump your own gas and I can't. It's just two. I'm going to live in one of them. <laughs> the third state is the state of delusion. <laughs> too lazy to pump their own gas. Come on, it's true. let's go. Come on. Okay, four important things, Sophie. I promise. Last, I have four things here. <laughs> religion, commerce, Greco-Roman philosophy, and enlightened liberal republicans. What is religion? Well, what I'm talking about right now is basically from 1492 until 1776. On the one hand, America has a very, very strong Catholic character, right? Columbus in 1492. Cortez in 1519, fine. He goes to Tenochtitlan, Mexico City, and Pizarro the same, 1532 in the Incas. That's uh, not, that's. Er <coughs> Leif, er uh, Leif Erickson before then. Leif Erickson, 1001, right? 1001. Alonso Meadow in Canada, right? 
So we have Viking religion, I guess, too. No, no, but they actually, they, were, they had churches, too. There were some pagans, but they were actually Catholics, too. What was Lee Ferguson? Yeah. I think he con he converted uh, later in his life. I don't know if he had converted when he was in Canada. But. Now he'd follow the religion of Greta Thunberg. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Lee Ferguson and Greta, how dare you? How dare you call this land? Um, Columbus, Cortez, and Pizarro, uh, let's focus on, I mean, those are the original Catholic guys that come over, but like DeSoto, Coronado, these guys in the Mississippi River Valley, right? Well, yeah, exactly. Look at all the different Jesuit missionaries, uh, all the way up, Marquette, et cetera. So from the founding, you look at St. Augustine, Florida, uh, New Orleans, New Orleans, very, very much so, is a very, very strong Catholic character. The traditional religious story in America is that tight-knit pilgrim community, right, in New England. That close-knit Puritan community were escaping their quote-unquote religious persecution of Elizabeth, post Henry VIII. We don't like how much the Anglicans hate our gods. Everyone hates us. We hate them. Not like Cromwell ever persecuted anyone. No, he didn't. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Catholics, Catholics in the South, Catholics in the South and the Mississippi River Valley, New England Puritans, and then you have in the Tidewater area. This this is the second big point I'm going to make. If you're, if you're really nerdy and you want to get really into the nitty and gritty, this is outside the, the scope of the class. Read someone like Reese Isaac, last name spelled as you assume, I-S-A-A-K, or Edmund Morgan, very famous um, American historian, recently died, God rest his soul, wrote a book on, um, they wrote a book on colonial Virginia. And they say this, basically, this is a super important point, no jokes, just straightforward. They say it's falsely assumed that America's ori original religious character is simply Puritanism in New England. Yeah, that's that's New England. That's Massachusetts Bay Colony. Really, the Tidewater people were quickly going to um, look at tobacco as gold and the importation of slaves and all that kind of stuff. They're just secular, money grubbing people. They're technically Anglicans, but their 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 religion is the American dollar. So, if you wonder, for instance, like how you can't serve God and Mammon, how long of a train in American history? Is there that stereotype that in America all that matters is, is success and making it and Instagram followers and money? Right back to Tidewater, right back to Jamestown um, in the early 1600s. So right away, okay, you have a tripartite. First point, this four point thematic mix, point number one, religion. You have a tripart religious um, paradigm. You have Catholics in the Mississippi River Valley, all the way up to Mississippi, New Orleans, the Gulf Coast area. Um, Florida, of Maryland. course, Maryland, very much the Calvert family, exactly. You have Catholicism there, you have Puritans um, in New England, and you have secular people in, in Tidewater, and then because we don't have enough complication, William Penn and the Quakers as well, Quaker Oats, and you have everyone kind of involved. Um, and there's a, there's a real big kind of um, mix. Most importantly, though, everyone, does everyone understand that mix? Everyone got that? Is, it, is that explanatory now? I wouldn't be surprised if you're like, you know, this class has been a great laugh so far, but we, there's been too many laughs. I don't know when to be serious. I'm asking seriously, everyone good with that? That first thematic mix religion, you have Puritans, money-grubbing, secular Tidewater people, Catholics kind of spread out, Quakers, it's interesting mix. The first great awakening is in 1730s, 1740s, big famous uh, figure of this is a guy named Jonathan Edwards. He had a famous sermon, I'm gonna mispronounce it or forget the exact title, but it's like angry sinners, you have sinners in the hands of an angry God, something like that. Just super Calvinism 101. Like, you know, you're dangling over the pit of hell on like a you know piece of floss kind of stuff. Fire, fire and brimstone, right? Okay, but what really makes the religious character as we're concerned, because remember, the war is 1861 to 65. What really makes the, what the religious character as we know it is something called the second great awakening. What year does this start in? I mean, this is always trending on Twitter, Second Great Awakening. You, can just, you don't have to even look for it. It's always there. <laughs> Who is it? About 1810, 1815. Perfect. Fantastic. Excellent. Very, very impressed. This is not, this is not like asking, like, what was Lincoln's first name? Maria, have you brought all of Wyoming with you. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Maria, you, Maria, Maria, you are a, a proud alumna of the University of Wyoming Cowboys, correct? Yeah. Yeah, that's an upset. Okay, you know she's amazing. All right. Um, yeah, really impressed. Thank you. It's a brilliant answer. Seriously, not being sarcastic at all. Brilliant. That's not a common thing. 1810, 1815, even 1805. What happens is uh, basically Baptists and Methodists conquer the South, right? It's, this, it's not Jonathan Edwards. You're hanging over a pit of hell on a cloth. It's very feel-good religion. I've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ and my personal Lord and Savior, Sola Scriptura to the max very positive, very love, I, I'm, I'm sure to my salvation, that kind of feel, kind of evangelical Christianity, for lack of a better word. The place where this gets most 
I don't know what the right respectful word is, but most interesting is where. What really comes out of what comes out of the burnt over district in New York? I thought it's like Mormons. The Mormons, right? Joseph Smith claims I found this tablet of reformed Egyptian and goes west. Eventually, bringing down takes people to Salt Lake City. We're going to talk about bringing down. We're going to talk a lot about it um, <clears throat> next next class, I think. It would not mean wives bringing down had. We'll save that for next class. Uh, okay, so because of the Second Great Awakening, this tripartite thing I already laid out for you that the first theme: religion, Catholics. Secular people just want to make money, very American, and the Massachusetts Bay Colony becomes really complicated, especially in the South, with the advent of this Bible evangelical religion. Now, this is where I'm like, this is imagine some mic, right? Drop the mic, right? Like the kids say. Um, this is a really important, really. I did, I did it wrong. Don't drop. Why don't drop the mic? Why? <laughs> See, I feel like I feel like I'm so, I feel like I'm so cool that if somebody can like cringe, I could do it. It's all, it's, it's all right. It's not that. <laughs> Okay, yeah, so probably the wrong audience for hip hop reference. Yeah, maybe. Who knows? Well, then let's get. Let's. I want to get the most diverse audience in the history of the world. This year, we have now. Oh, that's five thousand eight hundred people. They're leaving. They're voting at their feet. People don't, don't like the way the course is going. <laughs> <laughs> this is really important. Listen, this is super important because the Civil War, right, is the, the North USA versus the CSA. So the CSA, Baptist and Methodist, conquer the South, becomes evangelical, very personal Bible religion, like the South is today. What is the South called today? What is it called? Stereotypically, the Bible, the, the Bible Belt. Yeah, exactly. I do read it. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Can I ask what happened to the Catholics in the South? That is actually, I'm not even kidding. I will, shame, I will shamelessly pitch my book. My dissertation was on Catholics in the Confederacy. I wrote a book called, wait for it, Catholic Confederates. I actually read it. Freaking sweet. And he gave me a horrible review online. <laughs> <laughs> How could you tell it was here? I mean, there's so many. Oh, I can tell. I've got friends in interesting, interesting places. So Never been in I will. I promise you. Put that. Put, put that in the back burner. Super, okay. super interesting. If you want, read my book. I'll give you, I'll give you better information than I ever give, give in this class. It's all about Catholics in the South before the war, during the war, everything. I'll talk about that, especially in the international dimension thing. Okay. Very important kind of diplomatic intercourse between Jefferson Davis's government and Pius the Ninth, and etc. Excellent question. I, I promise. I will. The only reason I don't want to go in that rabbit hole now is I've already like, like some might go in. Epic Alice Wonderland, every rabbit hole possible okay. today. Um, and that would take us down another one. But I think we'll talk a lot about Catholics in the okay. South. I promise you this class. Uh, the, the South has become the Bible Belt, stereotypically, not everyone, a lot of Catholics, but not everyone, but, but generally speaking, there's this very evangelical um, section. What has happened to the North? Who knows? This will blow me away if you're listening. I'll be like, I want your autograph. We know the North is this puritanical Massachusetts Bay Colony. This historian named Percy Miller, because of course, a guy like that would write about stuff like this. He writes about <laughs> Puritans, right? He writes about, like, I love people are like, what does that mean? I don't know, <laughs> nothing. Just trying to get some laughs, cheap laughs. Percy Miller writes- Anti-Anglo sentiments. Well, no, no. What, what, does, what does Percy Miller's uh, declension thesis signify? This is what's really, and I promise we'll move, I will move off of religion at this point. He equated anti-slavery with anti-Catholicism? Uh, not yet, not what I'm looking for. Excellent though, yeah, when William, when William Lloyd Garrison and the, uh, the liberator, and especially Nat Turner's revolt in 1831. Oh, oh yeah, years, progressivism, that's what you're talking about. In a certain sense, exactly. What Percy Miller says is, by the time of the Civil War, by the time that we're in now, the antebellum period, 1810, 20, we're going to 1830, right? In that time period, the South has become solidly Bible Christian, one time saved, altar call, sola scriptura, like they are today. By 1830, the South has become the Bible Belt. Everyone knows what that means. But New England lost their faith. All those Puritans became secular people. And they decided, but you know what? I don't believe in God anymore, but I still want to tell people what to do, like temperance society right. and whatever, and women's suffrage. Now, I. <laughs> I am very woke on like, I love that women can vote and all this kind of stuff. I'll be totally pandering. And stop voting. But so I'm not trying to like insult women. I think women's suffrage is great. I think like that kind of feminism of the Seneca Falls Conference of 1848 was really good. But, but there is a quality here where it's like, we're, we're this tight-knit community and we used to believe in God. We're just close-knit Puritans. We don't believe in that anymore, but we still kept our reforming zeal. If you understand that, you can leave the class now, come back next class and you'll be fine. That is a great initial setup to the war. People say often the Civil War is fought between Massachusetts and Mississippi. 
or Massachusetts and South Carolina, which is the first state to secede. Meaning, the war is fought between people in South Carolina who are like, I'm a farmer, often a yeoman farmer. Only 4% of the people in the South own slaves. Most people are like, I don't care at all about that issue. And we'll talk about it in a second. I will give it, well, let's save that for a little bit later in class. Um, when we read the, the, the secession arguments, and we'll see, like, some people were outright scandalous. Yeah, just like we want to defend slavery, all that kind of classic stuff. A lot of people were like, we don't care about that issue at all. And we'll, we'll parse that away. I hope I'll leave, I hope you leave this class with your brain broken a little bit from these binaries of like, the war was all about slavery. Slavery didn't matter at all. Like, I hope I can break that and we'll talk about the nuances and where it really fits. People in South Carolina, often like in the Piedmont, Clemson area, they're like, I am a yeoman farmer. I'm, I'm not racist. I don't have slaves. I just want to be left alone. I want to read my Bible. And that's what I'm about. I'm about farmland, the agrarian life, playing bluegrass music and reading the Bible. And England's like, yeah, we want to tell you what to do. Like, why do you want to tell me what to do? Because I have to. I'm a Puritan. I have to make you do what I do. Like, stop drinking alcohol. Stop drinking your moonshine. Uh, and they're like, we want you to be left alone. We hate you people. And they're like, you love us. When you get to know us, you'll love us. Trust me. And so people in New England maintain this kind of reforming zeal. And of course, a lot of good stuff comes out of it. Thank God slavery is ended by the war. Thank God society is pushed forward by some of these progressive causes. The point is, you already see then this, like, we're going to end up like this. Because people in the South have, are still actually practicing religious. They actually have, have a vibrant religious faith. People in the North become materialistic. People in the North become very much focused on city life, urban centers. They want more of a kind of big, think like today, Democratic Party, I want Biden to tell everyone what to do kind of person. Like I want central, the federal government just to own my life. Uh, and people in the South are kind of getting more fractured. I want to kind of left alone. I don't even want, I hate the governor of South Carolina. I want my, the dog to be like the mayor of my city because he's a dog. Like, he can't tell me what to do. I want to be so individualistic. There are all these kind of things. If you don't believe me, another book suggestion, read W.J. Cash. Okay, spelled like Johnny. <laughs> in case you're like, how do I spell cash? At that point, you have, you, you, have, you have bigger problems if you don't if you don't know how to spell cash. <laughs> W.J. Cash wrote a book called The Mind of the South, okay? Which is Maria's favorite book? <laughs> um, she never said that. I'm just kidding. Uh, W.J. W. Cash wrote a book where he explains the mores of the South. Mores are kind of cultural norms the way Southerners act. And it's very, very accurate. It's from 1941, but it kind of explains. He's very fair. He's like, here's the good part of the South. Like, the South is very gregarious, like, very hospitable, family-oriented. Here's the bad part. The South is so violently tempered. If you even make a joke, they're like, let's test, test fight pistols. You know, that's dual. You know, like, super hot tempered, whatever. And he kind of lays out, in a certain sense, in a very basic, already stemming off this first theme, religion, and kind of you can expand it to larger philosophy of life, how the North and the South, even from the founding of the country, have very different views on what, what things should look like. If you don't believe me, look at like Alexander Hamilton and a central bank versus like Thomas Jefferson, the agrarians, and that kind of thing. Look at the Virginia Kentucky Resolutions, Alien Sedition Act, a lot of these things. They really have the writing on the wall towards this calamity that might not be inevitable, but when it comes to fast, we're like, oh, I get it. I get it because people are totally, they, might, they are different countries. Religion was number one. Any questions on that? First thematic thing, religion. Everyone good? Everyone understands that? It wasn't too good. Did you also put the uh, book on there, Albion Seed by uh, Hackett, Dave, right? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know the author, but yeah. Yeah. He's a, he talks about different, like, right, uh, different English cultural things that were planted somewhere, like Celtic culture and stuff, right? Can I just use clarification about the religion? Yeah, please. So we started out with our three of religions. We added the fourth about the evangelicals. But it's unclear to me, as we've gone to progressivism in the North, if we've actually eliminated religion in the North, or if they're using it as a political tool, or if there is still faith, but it's diluted by these economic factors, or how much of a role is it playing? Great question. So the audience is in a roundabout way. People talk about the reason art is so awesome is because art captures what's, what's real, but what also kind of ties together. So if I write a very, very good novel, it'll have the realism of like looking out the window at the snow covering the church, but also like will fit together. And you're like, oh, in a way that life doesn't. Life has a lot of randomness to it. Same thing here. Like I'm trying to artistically frame this. Like all I'm trying to give you is like a basic understanding. If you want to be super scientific and practical, no, that, that is too much for broad brush. You're right. There's lots of devout believers in the world. You look at the ultramontanism and like the super, the devotion to pious 
the ninth and the syllabus of errors, a lot of the Catholic bishops who fight the parochial school fight in the post-war era, where uh, Catholic bishops are like, I'm not going to send my Catholic kids to public schools because they give them, you know, Protestant wasp stuff. I mean, there's, there's a very strong, often like ethnic, Irish, Polish, whatever, very much so. I'm saying as a general sense, even if you're maybe a religious believer in the North, there is this idea of like, I like progress, like whatever that means now. I want more urbanism, more city, bigger government. And the South is like, we like want the clock to go back to the Middle Ages. There was a guy, Haddox, here's another book for you, H-A-D-O-X-X or 1X, whatever, you'll find it called Fears and Fascinations. And Haddox actually writes that the South, their ideal time was literally 12, 1200s. The Southerners of 1800 actually would like to take a time machine 600 years back to feudal Europe. They want almost that kind of society. That is not generally present in North. So it's, I'm broad rushing. You're correct. It's a matter of like scientific fact. But a lot of these things that I tell you, no, they don't speak for everyone. They just, in a certain sense, maybe are some good guideposts. That makes sense. Some good ways to frame the question. And do they speak for the sort of leadership in those areas? I would think so often. Yeah. I mean, look at like Lincoln. From what I know, Lincoln was very much like a secular guy. I don't know what church he belonged to or I don't know. He did. He, he did it. He like, yeah, talked about like the creator. Claimed to be a Christian, I think. Right. It's kind of like deistics, whatever stuff. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So that's the first theme, religion. Second theme, commerce. Really quickly. All right. You're going to have, I think it's as simple as possible, when mercantilism peters out, the kind of colonial economic engine, the best way to look at this, these are again all broad brushes, very simple things. Mercantilism basically said, Okay, Maria, you're Spain and I'm France, and there's 100 pennies on the table. If I have 73 pennies, how many can you have? There's a, right, that yeah, saying? exactly. Right, that's it. You, you can have 27. If you take 22, all of you people like Portugal and Poland and whatever, you guys get, have to fight over five pennies. There's a fixed amount of wealth in the world. We know Adam Smith writes his famous Wealth of Nations in 1776, the same year as our revolution. And he argues, right, that kind of wealth can be created. There's not 100 pennies in the table. How about we work together and, you know, you help my business, I do, we get rich together. The North, I would argue, is going to be much, much more interested in kind of, especially industrial capitalism. The South, apropos what I just said a couple minutes ago, has a feudal society. They almost have this kind of distributist agrarianism. That's a big difference. Sadly, tragically, because obviously slavery is evil. It's very, very bad. In the South, because of the conditions, et cetera, um, a lot of those big plantations folk function on slave labor, and that's the driving engine. But the critique to that, the kind of repost is, well, what about the Irish kids working in factories in the North for 20 hours? You know, but before, this is long before Upton Sinclair, 1906, um, the jungle, like, you know, any kind of workplace safety laws. Literally, you know, life expectancy for some of these poor kids, eight-year-olds, you know, getting their hands cut off in machines. There's different types of slavery in both sections. The point is, and yeah, and also the importation of slaves had stopped in 1808, whereas right. the, the slave... importation of Irish and Italian labor continued. Right. So the argument was always, Often, well, we as slave owners have uh, actually a vested incentive in keeping our slaves alive, whereas the northern factory right. owners don't. They can just get a new boat. Often the people coming over, and it, it obviously matches up with the, the terrible potato mm -hmm. famine in the 1840s, but right, under the guise, this happens during the war, a lot of people in the north will say, hey, Irishmen, come over to the north for better life, we just want you to be cannon fodder, actually, the battlefield. We want you to be in the front line, get blown off, your head blown off at Fredericksburg, Gettysburg, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, the, needless to say, this is, this is all of history. History is, uh, that, that's sad. History is history sad, to put it as black and white simple as possible. There's a lot of bad, you know, bad parts of history. We, we do better to face them head on rather than, you know, avoid them or euphemize them. Hey, um, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, largely because of what Hunter said, and you know, that hasn't really changed. Even today, we we don't tolerate slavery, but we certainly still have most of our products. I'll give you one great example. Created by I'll give you a great, a great example. Yeah, uh, yeah. There's cobalt is needed to run a lot of like your iPhone or something, okay? The, the situation, the cobalt mining in Central Africa in Congo is horrifying. So, oh yeah, I'm gonna listen to this woke guy uh, like striking for the climate in New York protesting like the racist people 300 years ago who we could do nothing about. It is bad being a racist back then. Racism is evil, it's awful. But they're dead 300 years ago. But he's not going to protest the slavery he could actually change today because he doesn't want to give up his iPhone. Right? Well, it doesn't matter. But my, 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 in 200 years, I'll talk about that. Right? <laughs> and so it's like, yeah, there's, there's often this bait and switch. Like, I'll pull down the statue of this evil white guy from 300 years ago, but I will keep taking my phone that's actually enslaving kids in Africa today. How about don't, don't support that? You can actually make a difference not supporting them. Right? But again, the complexity of 
but the human experience and the tragedy of humanity is as a Catholic, the, the, the manifest problems of original sin are always before our eyes, right? Exploitation is the oldest story in the book. Um, okay. We talked about religion, talked about commerce, basically the industrial capitalistic north versus very agrarian, kind of like distributist, um, almost feudal south, another big difference. If you haven't caught on yet, I know all of you have, you're all very, very smart people. These four themes, I'm showing you how, how the sides diverge, even already at that point, right? How about Greco-Roman philosophy? It's be very, very simple. These are, again, overstated simplicity, so hopefully helpful. The north is like Rome. All roads lead to Rome. The Romans, right? I don't care what you believe. We don't care about religion at all, as long as you pay taxes to Caesar. And you teach your kids Latin, and you build this road system here, whatever, like, we don't care. Like, we'll build up the outpost of the empire like the Persians did, with Cyrus the Great. As long as we have a, the, the Romans have a big switch, obviously, right, from republicanism into Octavian and the empire. And the, the southerners, who would like the old Rome of people like Cicero feel like that's a betrayal of what the US was about. We're not supposed to be this deeply centralized, all roads lead to Washington. Every state is supposed to be its own country, its own individual entity. And that's much like the Delian League Greek idea, um, which also becomes, if you know anything about the Peloponnesian Wars, also becomes betrayed in the same fashion. But basically, do some people use quote unquote states' rights as a euphemism for slavery? They do. But put that aside for a second, there were people in the South who actually believed in states' rights as the philosophical definition, meaning like, I am a South Carolinian. I don't care what Georgia or North Carolina think. That's a different country, right? That's like, I'm, in, I'm from Belgium. I don't care what France thinks. Even if we're part of the EU, like, I'm a Belgian. I want to be Bel This is what, if you follow European politics today, why people hate Matteo Salvini and Georgia Maloney in Italy or like Victor Orban because, oh, they're so, they just, you know, they, they're not going along with whatever Ursula von der Leyen wants to do in Brussels. And they would look at them like, you're like Abraham Lincoln. Like, we're not, we don't want Brussels to control all of Europe. Well, I'm a Hungarian. I want to do what's best for Hungarians. That political break is visible there. So it's not just religion, it's not just commerce. It's that in a certain sense, the Greek loose city-state kind of ideal is more found in the South, more of a confederation, literally a confederacy, whereas the North is more centralized. Finally, enlightened liberal republicanism. Once more, in, in the side, both sides take what they want from this. Okay. Both sides look at the constitution in Britain of 1688. Uh, the revolution of 1688, a glorious revolution. I'll never call it that because it's a post-Catholic game. F that. <laughs> um, that constitution, which we emulate so much in our own 1789, both sides like that kind of individual liberties. What are both sides going to claim during the war? What are both sides going to claim? By the way, before you answer, you're thinking, those are the four themes. The way the, 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 the South and North already, at the beginning, are kind of diverging. Commerce, philosophy, political philosophy, states' rights versus centralization, uh, commerce, economics. And this last point on the idea of like, we're the inher inheritors of the true liberal Republicans. What are people going to say during the war? Yeah, we're, we're the true heirs to the American founding project, and our view is the one which best fulfills what the founders thought. I can add nothing to that. It's absolutely perfect. It's exactly it. George Washington is, well, I'm his like son. Like, I'm the son of Washington. Like, you know, it, it, it'll actually speak. Like, Washington, he's my, he's my, I'm following in the footsteps of the founding fathers in the North because, of course, we're supposed to all grow as a country and be centralized. That's what Washington would want. Well, look at Washington, he put down in the Whiskey Rebellion. You know, and Washington was all about centralization. And then people said, like, well, look at Washington when he talked to the sterile address, avoid entanglements and these little wide things and stuff. Like, as today, right? You can, I can bring in to you people <clears> talk <throat> and five points why the Democrats are right and five other Republicans are right. You can make up your own mind. You know, people, that's what's fun about your opinion, right? People can convince you of a lot of different stuff in an interesting way, right? And these guys were trying the whole time saying, like, we're the real Americans. Okay. What are some key events we're going to see? Key chronological events. We're going to get done early today because class is 1 to 2 30. It's 1 52. That means we have exactly 38 minutes. And I don't think we're going to use it all. Hey, right? It's like, come on. No, no, absolutely not. It's like our flight, the, I felt the landing gear come out, right? I felt that bump. I'm like, oh, it's landing gear. And I'm like, we're not supposed to land for 50 minutes. We're obviously landing imminently. That's what this class is like. We're going to be done soon. So key events, 1776 through nullification. The American Revolution is 1776, 1789. Uh, <laughs> okay, what are the causes of the American Revolution? Anyone want to talk about this? The Quebec Act. Why? Interesting. 
Uh, the uh, the colonists actually were aggrieved that so in the French and Indian War, they, the Brits had taken over Quebec, which was French and Catholic, and the, um, uh, the Quebec Act gave Quebec um, the Catholic Church in Quebec the same status that it had under the French. So it could tax the local people in Quebec. Um, it had the territorial claims that Quebec had had under the French, and um, the colonists were worried that. This was a prelude to um, the glorious revolution being reversed and the British monarchy reconverting to Catholicism and establishing what they saw as like sort of feudal oriental despotism um, over uh, the American colonies. Okay. Anyone else? That's great. That's just one that most people haven't heard of. There's so, okay. so when we hear of railing against George III, and that's what's in our mind, was actually they were often railing against those negative powers that George the third refused to enact. So really many of the grievances the American Revolution that era had with was with Parliament and the decisions Parliament were making without consulting any of the Americans because the Americans had no representation in the House of Commons, no representation representation in the House of Lords. And George the third had veto power. And George the third wasn't really listening to the grievances at all, either out of ignorance or maliciousness or whatever. And so they just felt ignored. And that just that covers like a whole range of different problems, like pe like Americans being uh, drafted for English wars, American like financial issues, uh, Americans basic being exploited as a market for English producers of goods, uh, and then Americans not being able to sell to Europe, despite Europe being one of their biggest trading partners, also that sort of thing. Okay. Something quite simplistic, but it was a group of men who saw sort of a future where they were actually gaining enough strength where they didn't need to rely on the Britain, on Britain or the infrastructures that, that predated them. They wanted to claim the power for themselves and become something different. So it was actually a small minority of people who convinced a very large group of people that this was the way to go. Okay. Yeah, excellent. Uh, there are the, the, the tributaries of the Nile. There are so many different things that, that work in tandem. What I'll say quickly, this is not on the board, part of our chronology. Be, before, uh, from 1756 to 1763, something called the French Indian War, which is, as Hunter mentioned, is the American theater of the Seven Years' War going on concurrently in Europe. And uh, what happens is the, the, the British will triumph, the, the dispatch, kick out the French from America. So you have the kind of, yeah, Quebec friend, then Francophone, Louisiana, Lafayette people, the guys who like talk to gators or something, like their French is so falling down um, into the dumps. Uh, and uh, the duck dynasty guys speak French, they would know. Because if they do, like, that's mad respect, they would know. I know that Phil Robertson, the main duck guy, he was a quarterback at Louisiana Tech when Terry Bradshaw was there. Do you know Terry Bradshaw is? Mm -hmm. Famous Hall of Fame quarterback for the Pittsburgh Steelers. He, uh, Doug, P, Phil Robertson started ahead of Bradshaw for two years. True story. Did you know this? And uh, he quit. I'm, I kid you not. This is kind of like, what I'm going to say now is like, he, and then he went inside because it was raining and then he was wet. So Phil Robertson quit because he wanted to hunt ducks. <laughs> like, <laughs> the most obvious. There was like, he literally said that. Like, he'd come to practice like with like duck stuff on him. And he's like, I just, I don't want to hunt a bunch of ducks. But it worked out great. It worked out great for everyone. Everyone won. Terry Bradshaw, he won. If Phil Robertson, the Cajun guys can speak French, they have super mad respect. But it's nice to find that out. Oh, wait, Phil Robertson? Sadly, not Phil. Duck Yeah. That could, okay. Yeah, that guy. Duck Dynasty guy. Not that guy. No. no. Okay. Not it's not the same thing? No. Robertson. It's Duck Dynasty. That's I, Duck Dynasty. Like that's what I got. Duck Dynasty. Okay. Yeah. Duck, no, Duck Dynasty is a show. Duck Limited is not like their product. It's something different. Yeah. Okay, okay, but not that's well, that's not a group of mm -hmm. yeah. I got that I got that answer wrong, but I want all you to know, trust me, I know ducks. I know ducks. <laughs> okay, so the, the French are kicked out and the British issue something called the Proclamation of 1763, which to your excellent point about the Americans kind of coming in, feeling the oats of their new identity. We've been here since. 1620, 1607, 100 years, we're no longer just subjects of the king. We want our own identity. The British tell them, hey, I know you guys are the ones that died, 
your comrades and everyone died fighting the French, but no one can send a West Appalachian Mountains for 10 years. They're like, that's bull crap. And then two years later, the Stamp Act, right? Taxation of representation, that famous thing. The war kicks off, the, the most famous, despite Washington's crossing the Delaware and all that, the most important part of the American Revolution is the Battle of Saratoga, October 14th, 1777. That's when the French come to our aid um, and then surrender shortly after. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> the, French, the French come to our aid. They win the anyway. actually won the war, most of the war. Yeah, well, they, 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 they win the Battle of Saratoga and they surrender. And the Americans are like, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, sorry, what happens? We won. Oh, we won. Yeah, my bad. Uh, they already had the white flag ready. Put that away. <laughs> If the French don't help us in Saratoga, we probably continue to lose the war. And in fact, you're right. The decisive war, the decisive battle of the American Revolution is at Yorktown in 1781. I love how all my World War, World war I people, their minds are blown now. So like, we just spent four months working through the literal trenches of the Somme, the Western Front, and we're gonna cover the American Revolution in five seconds. Like, are you serious? We spent four months on the Great War and on this? Yeah, that's what we're gonna, that's what we're gonna do, sorry. The war ends at Yorktown in 1781. There are more Frenchmen there to receive Cornwallis's surrender than there are Americans. So yeah, the French really save our bacon, help us out. Mm. The Treaty of Paris of 1783 ends the war. The signing of the Constitution, here's a pop quiz, of 1789. You all know the four themes now, right? In review, commerce, Greco-Roman philosophy, enlightened uh, liberal republicanism and religion. Who is the Constitution at triumph for? Who is that triumph for? Is it for the Greek South or the Roman North? Who likes the Constitution? The North. The North, the North, the North. Centralization, totally, exactly. In fact, the stupid Southerners had this thing called the Articles of Confederation. Everyone's like, no, right? Absolutely not. This is way too loose, uh, you know, and it has the word Confederate in it, so it's bigoted, mm -hmm. right? It's gonna get flagged on Twitter as well. They can't have this going on. The Constitution absolutely is uh, kind of a Northern triumph. And in fact, the 90s, right? Not the Friends 90s, the recent memory, Friends DVD, Joey and Monica, I mean, 1790s, are very much a triumph for centralization in the North. Like I talked about uh, the creation of the bank, Alexander Hamilton, Washington putting down the Whiskey Rebellion, Alien and Sedition Acts, all these kind of things that are really working towards increase of federal power. Where is the pushback? Where do we see the first shot fired back against the Romanizers and centralized world? What happens? What is this monumental event? Dominic said, don't drop the mic, check that. Drop mm -hmm. it a second time. Yeah, tell your coworker from Texas to look at that. <laughs> and oh, wait, he's on Zoom. He can't stop me. He's watching on Zoom now. Look at that, buddy. Third time. <laughs> what is the shot back across the back? What? This isn't the whiskey you're talking about. No, it's 1794. The election of Thomas Jefferson in 1800 is the pushback. Jefferson is an agrarian guy from the South, from Virginia. Ele Jefferson's election. And it becomes exacerbated probably with Andrew Jackson, yeah. the most uncouth guy coming into office. Jackson, like he he spit water and like ate tobacco in like, reverse. He drank tobacco. Like the guy was so backwards. Um, he taught his parrot to swear. Yeah, parrot. That literally says it all. <laughs> like, he invited everyone over to the White House to eat cheese. That sounds <laughs> yeah. that sounds dignified. I'd be to hear the parrot say bad words. Exactly. What a guy. He so attempted to sass some half death and stick. He did what? Someone attempted to assassinate him and he beat him half to death to the Ooh, stick. Oh, right. <laughs> but the good news. I bet the guy didn't try again. <laughs> but the good news is he was so horrible that he gave a lot of strength to the to be developed Republican Party, hence Lincoln. Okay, fair enough. Also yeah, because he was a Democrat. He killed the central bank until the Federal Reserve came about. So Federal Reserve is 1913. Yeah. Sounds like a win to me. Yeah. Anyone hear that the conspiracy of the Titanic was sunk on purpose because the guys were on their YouTube posts, JP Morgan, the creation of the Titanic. Yeah, everyone's heard that. I feel like you guys are all good. I I'm believe it's true. I've never heard it, but I believe it. I believe it's true. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, two seconds, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> and the icebergs were unionized. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Um, okay. So. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, what are the current chronological things? Maria's like, in Wyoming, we don't, we don't do this. We don't, we just get the facts. Okay, Maria, calm down. The facts, the facts. <laughs> so, 1776 revolution, right? Triumph of centralized Roman people, so to speak. Jefferson pushed back. Uh, the British tried to get us back in something called the War of 1812. 
Not really. It's a sideshow for them. They're busy with putting down Napoleon. Waterloo is 1815. And in fact, our guy Andrew Jackson wins the seminal battle of that war, the Battle of New Orleans, in January of 1815, after the war is already over. And so it's literally like Alabama comes to play in the University of Idaho Vandals, right, and beats us 100 to nothing. The, 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 British, the British burned down the White House. I mean, they won the war, right? That's the, like, well, we fought, look at the casualty numbers. We burned them down before the president was. Okay, you guys win. Uh, Alabama comes here and they, 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 they beat the Vandals 100 to nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and then they burn down the Kibbe Dome, they leave, and then we stage a flag football game on the little like uh, track place. I'm like, yeah, look, that's our great victory. We defeated Alabama. That's kind of what it is. The Treaty of Ghent is signed in, in uh, 1814. It doesn't reach the, the, the communication is so slow, obviously. The internet was down and they couldn't get it to across to America. And so the, the Battle of New Orleans, which is a stunning American victory, it's why Jackson Square in New Orleans, this historic statue of the horse overlooking Mississippi, that's actually after the war. But what's important, my friends, is this. I mean this. Your great point that Americans are your feeling like we're Americans, no longer subjects. The first punch to that is the revolution. Down King George, right? He's gone. We're Americans. 1815 guarantees they're never going to try to get us back. Now it's really America all the way. In fact, the Monroe Doctrine, Lee Stardust of 1823, declares henceforth the Western Hemisphere is closed to colonies and it's only open for democracies. So double like it's not stay out Europe. And basically, it's not only all bark, no bite. It's like, please don't come and get us again. <laughs> like, um, there's, not, there's not even any kind of, we're just like, please, we're scared of you guys. You were in the White House last time. Please stay away. Um, to understand one of these motivations, in the Federalist paper, there's an excellent moment where I think it's Hamilton is talking. There was, there was some French biologist slash social theology uh, philosopher who was basically saying, even the things that are born in America are weaker. Like the dogs go there just because they're born on American soil, they're weaker. So part of Hamilton is trying to gun up support for the Constitution by saying, look, like we don't want to let these, these hoity toy Europeans just say that we're worse off than them when you're, you're like, we're the ones out on the frontiers doing all these great things. <laughs> and so, but it's just that, but that was, there was a legitimate theory of, yeah, just things just being on American soil were worse off. And so is an American. Yeah. It was in Americans' minds that we need to do something great in order to show those French and British and things have they have all these theories they're wrong. Jefferson's response to that was sending the Europeans to taxidermy moose. <laughs> <laughs> that seems like a good Valentine's Day. <laughs> Anyone thinking about like you know their significant other taxidermy moose Valentine's Day? <laughs> tell me, tell me your thought. Tell me your th any women want to comment? The man, your wife, that you taxidermy moose? I thought of you. Anyone like? That touches right here. Yeah, uh, and to, to, your, to your point, <laughs> thank you for that. Epic fact, really, it's awesome. <laughs> Love this. This class is freaking, please, I hope you guys come rest much. This is so much fun. Um, yeah, this is awesome. Thank you. This is amazing. That's a great, that's what the, the class date is like an episode. Episode one, season one, text the news. I think today's episode. I'm actually trying to put that online. Have Anna put that online. Um, <laughs> Do you guys know, you guys want to chip in some money? I heard if for $100, you can buy like 80,000 bots online. We can have bots artificially upload the videos, like the uplink. <laughs> like, why the hell does Zeno Catholic, they have two subscribers? Why do they have six, six million views? <laughs> it's all bots, who cares? I don't care. Real people are overrated. I'm all on board with the AI revolution. Um, your, your point though, no, it's an excellent point. Uh, well, the response to that is Frederick Jackson Turner's way ahead now, historian. Also not born, really cool guy. Actually, I don't know, he's a cool name. Uh, he presents at the 1893 World's Fair in Chicago, this thing called the frontier thesis. And what he argues is that America, as it becomes more and more to the frontier, they become more and more real American. Like the colonists were more, more and more hardy, more bootstrapped, more like men fences, real tough people. On the Eastern seaboard, <coughs> excuse me, then the British, People in the Ohio Valley more than them. People in Wyoming the most, right? Because the further you go west, and then you get to California, it's like bell curve. Come on. <laughs> but like the people in the Mountain West, like Laramie, Wyoming, like I'd like they're like you go to Laramie, Wyoming, and like you can get poisoned by the testosterone in the air. Like if you're from if you're from the east, like that's why they wear masks. There's just too much testosterone in the air, and like they'll die. Like they just not, it's not present in the east anymore. <laughs> okay, where where were where were we seriously? Okay, um, wait, I'm gonna go back to this point though. Okay, right. real Americans being on the uh, frontier. 
So I'm going to go to the point that real America actually as settled by the colonists. So I'm going to avoid that whole Native American um, controversy is actually still European in its foundations. The art is European. The sensibilities are European. The religions for the most part are European. The politics are European. So it wasn't actually a break from European culture. It wasn't a break from European mindset. It wasn't a break from Europe. So like you were giving me these nice nods and I'm like, gosh, and it's not actually what I meant. Mm -hmm. There was a group of people who saw a chance to rise to power. And those were the people who I believe started the American Revolution because mm -hmm. they're like, this is our chance. You just dragged everyone else with them. It was like a handful of people mm -hmm. who started like the newspaper articles and the minor rev the minor revolutions and the minor indignities. So yeah, I think it was a group of people who were like, yeah, this is our chance. We're gonna have our own little fiefdom here, our own kingdom. And we've got all this land that we can do with it, but the sensibilities are still European. Even as we're moving west, the sensibilities are still very there's, much yeah, European. This, this Western civilization is white people. Nobody's. Uh, yeah, no, so, I, I completely, okay. I completely so agree with that. I just wanted to. No, I think like, yeah, no. To be clear, I agree with that, and I agree. With Jackson Turner would say the same thing. What he would mean is like, the people again, and, and this, I'm not saying this to the present company. Seriously, but I mean, like. <laughs> I talked about Wyoming like way more than you thought in a civil war class. Um, but whatever. Like, no, actually, I'm not going to apologize. I don't care. Uh, <laughs> Wyoming, they would say, the, the, if you think about the Wyoming cowboy, Montana, like even like parts of Idaho, right? The most like kind of Western states, of course, the European culture. What Frederick Jackson Turner would say is like, that's the whole Theodore Roosevelt thing. Roosevelt claims often, right? Roosevelt is very, very elite, German family, Harvard educated, fluent in German, you know, New York upper crust. But he said he's made by the Badlands. Like when he went out to the Badlands and they did whatever, like slept with with like moose or something, like you know, killed moose and that was his blanket and you know, shot animals. If you want to know a guy who shot a lot of animals, remember last class, Franz Ferdinand, he killed 250,000 animals. That guy was the man. Um, and I'm not I'm not a huge hunter. I just that guy was like he like, yeah. But hunting also is a European tradition. Right. And that's but that's what but that's what he would say. He's like those right. people, those people in Wyoming aren't any less of the, the American tradition, the Western civilization tradition of people in New England, the, the geographical circumstances that made them hardier. And like, you look at kind of like, I think this is true about like women's history in the West. Yeah, uh, the, the stereotype in the South, right? The Southern Bell, like, oh, you know, my stars, I'll melt with the water. If I go outside, right? <laughs> like bring my porcelain gloves. You know, the kind of like very dainty Southern Bell. And I went to a party once in the South, um, the Kentucky Derby party, and I've never seen more like the bell of the Southern Bell. Like just like, oh my gosh, are you guys? You guys are doing a roll. This is a joke, like a stand up, like so Southern Bell. That's cool. But what I mean is, that's not like a Wyoming, Nebraska woman who is like, yeah, like I was eating barbed wire with the men when we were doing making the the the, the mud hut or something, right? So like, yeah, that like the hardy the hardy Western woman that stereotype any more or less American than Southern Bell? No, but it's a different culture. Yeah. All right. I'm going to argue that those Southern Bells, though, swayed many more minds and made much more policy than the people uh, in the well, I, that's, so, the so Wyoming women got the vote first. The Wyoming women were, yep, yeah. they were, they love the way I'm at. South Pass City, Wyoming. Thank city. you for representing the, the Wyoming women suffrage. You, you want to represent Wyoming too, though, yeah? Are you from yeah. Wyoming as well? I went to Wyoming Catholic College. <laughs> I heard, that, from years. Years. I heard that place. I'm like, married to He's a southerner. He's, he's a southerner. That's legit. I am, yeah. So, where are you from? I am from Arkansas. Arkansas is sick, man. How, how many times have you yelled Blue Big City as loud as you can? You think in your life? It's been a long time. A long I, used time? To go, I used to go to football. It's good memories, though. You gotta, you gotta do that once in a while, right? Just go yeah. out in the shed and just scream as loud as you can. That's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Wyoming Catholic College is freaking sweet. <laughs> yeah, Wyoming Catholic College, yeah. Yeah. I. <clears throat> I can't, I have nothing bad to say. I mean, they think of a joke. Like, yeah, it's awesome. Uh, Lander, Wyoming? Yes. Yeah, freaking sweet. Okay. Um, okay. Last two things to talk about today. Last two things. Uh, nullification is really this first big sign of like uh, what maybe can actually come to pass politically. South, South Carolina doesn't like the protecting protection of the tariffs that protect northern industry. 
And so they basically say, uh, the constitution allows us to nullify any law we find unconstitutional. That first point, remember the four themes? Uh, enlightened liberal republicanism, the constitution, even if we think in the South, we don't like that Rome thing, that's still the law of the land. Uh, the constitution clearly stipulates, we Southerners argue from Arkansas or South Carolina, that Arkansas is its own state, South Carolina is its own state. By that I mean its own nation state. South, uh, John Calhoun doing his best, Victor Orban impression. And like, we just are gonna nullify that law. And the North can just go bite wood. I don't know, whatever, kick sand. Whatever they, whatever, they can just deal with it, like they. And eventually, uh, the compromise of 1833, South, South Carolina will nullify even the forcible force bill. Uh, it's a long, long story. We don't have time right now. But just think that 30 years before the war, the nullification crisis is rough from 1828 to 1833, 30 years before the war. You already have this massive breakdown in religion, commerce, Greco Roman philosophy, political views, and actually some states acting, going rogue, the North would say, and saying if they don't want to follow, we're just not going to do it. And we haven't even talked about the import of slavery. Slavery completely tears the country apart. I would argue this is what I mean by nuance. Uh, there are people today that say slavery was the most important issue, the only issue, and it wasn't an issue at all. I do think it's the most important cause of the war, but it's not the only cause. And we're going to talk about why next class. We haven't even talked about how, we haven't talked about Dred Scott, the Compromise 1850, um, Romal Provisio, vis a vis the Mexican American War. You already see at this point, okay, there's some serious disunity in America, which a woman, her last name I think is Barron, Elizabeth Barron, I think, Pennsylvania professor, wrote a book called Disunion. And exclamation point, disunion, exclamation point. So type that into the library search catalog. And she talks about like, this is our, the seeds of this are being really fomented. I promise when we fire the first shots on Fort Sumter on April 12th, 1861 in this class, we relive that. You're not gonna be like, whoa, where did that come from? You're like, I got it, I get it. It's Teddy Roosevelt's fault. That's what you're saying. <laughs> You'll find out why. The last point, though, beginnings of manifest destiny. This is what I'm going to really catapult us into the discussion with next class with Brigham Young, Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, the famous California gold rush. No one even knows. Oh, California, 49ers. No one knows a more compact gold rush actually took place in Colorado. I don't blame you. Colorado is very forgettable, and you should you should not remember Colorado or anything to do with that state. But uh, it was actually a more compact version of the Oregon Trail, thick spout spigot west towards, you know, California. Territorial questions will go hand in hand with slave state, free state, all this kind of stuff that will lead us into the hottest point probably of the pre-war era, which is bleeding Kansas famously. We'll have to bring in, we have really awesome folks missionaries from Kansas, Bryson, Allie, they're Kansas State Wildcats. They've both gotten, well, Allie got us. Interesting story. Ali got mad because I was wearing um, a KU, a Lawrence, Kansas Jayhawks shirt. And she's like, you can't wear that, blah, blah, blah. Like, whatever, I'm going to kind of wear it. I don't care. And she was so nice. She bought me a Kansas State Wildcat sweatshirt. She was like, you should wear that. And it's my favorite sweatshirt, then, for real. It's perfect, really nice, very kind of her. So, and she, they, they didn't even believe me when I said I wear it because my grandfather found me in Lawrence. He's the mayor of Lawrence. They're like, that's, that's bullcrap. They were right. You're pretty cheaply bought, it sounds like. That's all I need is a sweatshirt. Yeah. That's why I told you, if I, if I was a governor, if I was a gubernatorial candidate for Idaho, I'd be so freaking cool. Like, I'd be like, let's get let's start the corruption now. <laughs> so what do you guys want to offer me? Like, let's, I, I would invent scandals, real bad ones. And like, if I wasn't true, it would like lower the impact from the real ones, not the real scandals. All right. Uh, yeah. Manifest destiny, right? The most, what's the most important moment of manifest destiny? 1803, what happens? Purchase. Louisiana Purchase. Mm. Jefferson doubles the size of America overnight. Oh, Jefferson, the agrarian guy, being very rose to Rome, executive order, doing his best. Biden, Trump, whoever you prefer, Obama impression, just boom, buy that land. Yeah, it doubles out the land from, from Napoleon Bonaparte, the real guy, Napoleon Bonehead, selling it for like freaking two cents an acre. What a moron. Um, <laughs> but, but he's French, right? Okay, it's not his fault. He was on better soil. He was yeah, worse yeah, than yeah, yeah, so. the even worse. Even worse. Yeah. Better for him. No part of so, the French is forcible. I know that's what he said. So I'm saying it's, I, I, more sympathy. I don't blame him. Poor guy. Yeah. Just, yeah. You know, he should have been sent to uh, whatever it was, St. Helena the first time. <laughs> no, I don't know why he didn't do that the first time. Of course he came back. Of course he came back. I thought they um, sent him there the first time. No, Elvis. Yeah. 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 Ah. 
really big mess up. And he comes back like, I can't believe he came back. We sent him five feet away. <laughs> we had this battle. We had the battle of the Palouse. We exiled the Colfax. Why is he back in the Palouse? Colfax is the Palouse, you moron. Okay. <laughs> so the size doubles in 1803. And then things start happening like uh, the Rush Bagot Treaty, the demilitarization of the Great Lakes, the discussions with Canadians. Discussing these Canadians is like, you just do what we say. I'm like, okay, that's what I mean by that. A bunch of Southerners moving to Texas, and then decide Texas should be part of Mexico. We're going to talk so much about the empresarios in Texas, Teos y Cajulia and all that. We'll do the next lecture in Spanish um, mm -hmm. to honor the Mexican-American world. I'm not even kidding, guys. It would be really fun in this class if we had different like different lectures, different languages, and then subtitles. That'd be so awesome. <laughs> like, I, I would only do that if we had a significant online following. If we had a significant following, it'd be so funny because it'd be like all these annoying like people from the East would be like, how dare they do this lecture in uh, in Swahili? This is offensive. This is American Civil War. Like, I would just love to piss people off like that. <laughs> <laughs> and do it where we only do it for like three minutes and then do it in English, but they had to turn it off. Like, oh, never again, never again, Vendel Catholic. And then they write a mean letter. Why my 10 cent contribution a month is no longer yours. I'm like, whatever, right? We don't need those people, Trish. We don't need those people. Uh, that's it, basically. My friends, that's it. The, the, the combination of the American Revolution plus the War of 1812, meaning the British are not going to get us back. We're the Americans now. We need to some really awful stuff. Like you said, this horrible trail of tears, Indian removal, all that. Andrew Jackson, the chair occasion. It's terrible. I didn't say that. It's I, just not I, the topic. I, you guys, hey, I will never tell anyone in this class what to believe. I think it's terrible. I think it's awful. Um, it, there's a good book on that. Um, Elliot West. I wish I knew the title. Elliot West, like guns. And, Jared Diamond wrote a book, Guns, Germs, and Steel. Elliot West wrote some book about contested planes, I think. And I think uh, we'll, I'll, we'll get into why it's terrible maybe later in the class, but a lot of. Um, how, Ryan, how many black slaves did they take with them on the trail of tears? What? How many black slaves did the Cherokee take with them on the trail of tears? A number. Oh, they did. They did. But there are thousands, I think. Is, yeah. Yeah. Broken humanity. God help us all. God have mercy. The Cherokee fought for the South. Right. Uh, the, Cherokee, the, the Cherokee Nation mainly ends up in Oklahoma. Right? It does, and then they fight for the South. Right. Right. So we'll talk. We'll talk about, about so that as well. All the five, five civilized crimes. Right. Around, so. We'll we'll talk about all that um, in the war, especially there. There's a kind of like not misappropriation, but almost misunderstanding of the Eastern and the Western Front, where you think like the two seminal victories, the twin defeats of 1863, Gettysburg and Vicksburg, and it's like indeed Vicksburg and Mississippi, this great citadel on the Mississippi River, and Gettysburg in Southern Pennsylvania. Yeah, that is the East and the West. But you also have some extended fights into New Mexico, Oklahoma, that kind of thing, right? It truly is, I'm looking for the right word, how not to phrase this awkwardly, because it would be awkward to say a, a world war within America, a global civil war. That's, that's, that doesn't make sense. A Pan-American. It's a kind of Pan-American, yeah, it's a global kind of thing. And there's, there's involvement with Mexico, there's Maximilian in Mexico. There's, kind of, there's the Russian fleet. Right. New York Harbor. Yeah, the, the Russians. Yeah. Well, yeah. And the Russians had been involved. The Russians plotted Fort Ross, I think, in 1812. You know what the worst part? The, the Russians found Fort Ross in 1812. And the most embarrassing thing is the New York Times is still blaming it on Putin. He wasn't alive, then, but <laughs> just don't have it. The, the Greek writer Thucydides thought that the Peloponnesian War was the most important, the greatest war in all of human history. That was it. I think the American Civil War might compare, though. I think the American <laughs> Civil War is the most interesting war of any war that America has. I fought. agree with you. I, but we all also still the Persian read, Wars were a worldwide, weird. we still read the Peloponnesian <laughs> War. That's true. And a lot of places don't read about the American <laughs> Civil War. Well, so, the Cities must have been right. So the Cities might well, have Well, I'll right. plug. And the Trojan War. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plug two things for you guys. I'm going to plug two things right now, shamelessly. Actually, I'm not even ashamed at all. I don't care at all. Uh, we're, we're almost out of class. Uh, Earl and Barbara Aston, the two of you, thank you so much for joining us. I hope you can join us every class. I think you talked to the, the wonderful Anna Kresslins who came into our class earlier about logins. There should not be a Zoom password. I had the same problem with Dave Schmidt, who solves every issue, also had a problem with this. If you can't do it, no one can. And it seems for some reason, when you click on Vandal Catholic and ask for a passcode, you could just do what you, what you did today, if that works, to log into the Zoom and then that way. But I'll try to maybe send out a link with the, I don't know, we'll see. I'm so glad you all could join us. I hope all of you will join us throughout the semester, Monday and Wednesdays from 1 to 2.30. The two plugs I wanted to say was, in, I plugged my World 1 class. We, I, and I go, there, you know, you can go watch the old 
videos of that online um, if you want. I guess that's the cool. It doesn't say that's where it makes sense. Like it's already in the past, but it does make sense. You can still go rewatch the great, yeah. great times from that class. The Germans, when the Americans joined the war, remember in 1917, they were scared because they read a lot about the Americans. Were like every American has 35 guns, sleeps with like 35 guns under his pillow. So you read stories about like Wyatt Earp and the Wild West American Civil War. So the Germans read about the Civil War. Um, second plug, guys. Okay, let's go. All right, listen. I am giving my first Hippo lecture on the 19th. Okay, it's called Label Catholics. Today, like an hour and a half ago, Anna and I filmed a promo video for it. It's absolutely hilarious. It's like SNL opening quality. It's really good. And if I do say so myself, if you go to the Vandal Catholic Instagram, I do the promo video for it. It's on the 19th here at 6 p.m. Before I pan, I think there's mass always, right? There's adoration and mass on Wednesdays. Is that correct? Also, if you're a real, real, like, just total, like, I have no shame type person, only thing I care about is free food. There's free food. If that's you, it's like, I, I don't want, if you're thinking about me, like, I don't want to listen to this one on talk, that's fine. You can just come for the food. And then all think, even though you hate my guts, you stay for the food, I just pumps up the attendance numbers. Um, but the top, I think the talks can be really, really good. It's called Label Catholics. And it's so vicious. I just, like, roast all these people throughout who are label Catholics. What I, the argument is, you're either Catholic or you're not. You're either Catholic or you're not a Catholic. Not, I'm a leftist Catholic. I'm a liberal, conservative, alt-right Catholic. Isn't, you're a Catholic, you're not a Catholic. I'm really hard on these people that I actually have to apologize to them at the end, like in my talk. I have to be like, well, here's their good qualities because it's very bad. But like, I, I can't wait to share this with you to see what you think. So if you're interested in coming, it's on the 19th. Uh, Mr. Earl and Miss Barbara and anyone else on Zoom, if you're, if you're so inclined, if you're like, I don't want to, it's too icy or it's too cold, or I just prefer to watch from home. I'll try to have it on Zoom as well for anyone else who's interested um, listening um, over the telewaves. Thank you all for coming with us. Anything else? And that's it. Class is over. You guys are all lovely. Thank you. I learned so much. I really, today, that was the quote of the day. Um, Taxidermified movies. Taxidermified movies. That's going to be the name of this episode. Thank you all. I'll see you all on Wednesday. In your syllabus, you mentioned.